Like father, like son, you've heard it before. I've never heard anyone say like mother, like daughter. But are you like your father, male or female? Are you like a parent? One of my favorite John F. Kennedy stories is when his father was kidding him about JFK's daughter, Caroline. He said, she's so cute and she's so much smarter than you were at her age, Jack. Well, JFK replied with his characteristic wit and said, yeah, but look who she has for a father, implying that he was a better father than his father. Great sense of humor. But I wanna to talk today about the father and the Son in the Trinity. Jesus Christ is like his Father, and he is like his Father God. We've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, an ancient statement of faith that has been with the Christian Church for over 1,500 years, and we spent four studies looking at the Father, and now we're on our second study of the Son. This is the Apostles' Creed. You might want to recite it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Four studies on God, God the Father, Almighty, and Creator, Maker of heaven and earth. Last week we looked at Jesus Christ our Lord, Jesus his humanity, Christ his office, Lord his deity. This week we look at his sonship, some of the translations of the Apostles' Creed, put it that he is the only begotten Son, as John 3.16 says. Yes, the Apostles' Creed is not inspired or error-free, but it is an ancient and valuable summary of Orthodox Christian belief. And so tonight, we look at Jesus, not in his humanity, Christ, his Messiahship, or Lord, his deity, but his Sonship. If he is the only begotten Son, what does that mean? Hi, I'm Jeff Hartman, pastor of First Baptist Church in Troy, North Carolina, and tonight we continue with our sixth study of 20 in the Apostles' Creed, the Sonship of Jesus Christ. What does it mean that Jesus Christ is Son? So is he really the Son in a literal fashion? What do we mean when we say Jesus is the Son? We should be aware that the Bible uses this term for others than Jesus. For instance, the angels are called the sons of God. In Job chapter 1 and 2, Job 1, 6, now there was a day when the sons, plural, of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. We understand this correctly as angels, but they are called not just sons, but the sons of God. Later they come back in the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 1, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. That would be Jehovah God, and Satan came also among them. So is Jesus just the Son of God in the same sense that the angels are sons of God, his creation? We see it later in Job chapter 38, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy at creation, the angels were there singing God's praises, but they were called sons of God. So angels are called sons of God. Is that all that Jesus is, another created being? We also see that human beings are called sons of God. For instance, in the genealogy of Christ through Mary's line, he traces it back from Mary and all the way back to Enosh, son of Seth, the son of Adam. And Adam is called the son of God. He is not Jesus Christ. He's not part of the Trinity. But as a creation of God, this human being is called the son of God. So are we saying that Jesus is nothing more than a creation of God? In Genesis chapter 6, there's a strange story about the sons of God seeing the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. There's some disagreement among scholars, conservative scholars, who take this literally and take it seriously. Are the sons of God the angels, and can they intermarry with human beings? 
Later on in verse 4, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, procreated, and they bore children to them. They turned out to be giants. Some understand this to be angels intermarrying with human beings, and others, like myself, see this to be as godly line of uh, Seth's descendants intermarrying with an ungodly line. This could be human beings. That's what I'm going to take it, but either way, we've seen angels are called sons of God, and humans are called sons of God. That story we'll save for later. But also, there are other times when it is used. For instance, in Exodus 4.22, Israel, a nation, is called the Son of God. God tells Moses to say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Well, Adam was born before Israel, the nation, and the man Jacob, Israel. And also in Hosea 11.1, 1, this prophecy, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now that is applied to Jesus because Jesus fled to Egypt to escape from Herod. And this was applied as a prophecy about Jesus. But Hosea is just referring to Israel as God's son. So we see angels and humans and even a nation referred to as the son of God. But there is a sense in which Jesus is more than that. We have to know that because we are, we, are, we are called Christians, followers of Christ, and he's not just an angel, a created being. We see at Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, 17, suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Much more than Adam, much more than the angels, much more than the nation Israel, God says, this is the one that you've been waiting for. This is my son, not just my creation, but a very part of me. Did you know that that occurs twice in the book of Matthew? Later on, when Jesus was teaching, the heavenly father interrupts. A voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Don't listen to the Old Testament. Listen, yes, listen to it, but listen to Jesus. He trumps that Jesus is the beloved Son, and hear Him. In a special way, Jesus is the Son, for Jesus prays to His Father in His high priestly prayer, John 17, 1. He lifted up His eyes to heaven, and He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that Your Son may also glorify You. He addressed the Heavenly Father as His Father in a way that is much deeper and much different from the way we refer to him as our Heavenly Father. And he is God's Son in a way that the angels are not and no human being is. You and I are not. Jesus is called the Son in a special way. Yes, others are called sons of God, but they are not in the relationship that Jesus is, as we will see in our study tonight. Jesus is further called the only begotten of the Father. For instance, John 1.14 the very first chapter, the word that we saw in verses 1 and 2 was with God in the beginning. That word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's not just the firstborn. He's the only born, the only one begotten by the Father. Later on in the same chapter, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus is a son of God like others, but unlike others, he is the only begotten. Of course, we know this from the most familiar and most well-loved verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We don't worship Adam. We don't worship angels. We worship the Son of God because he's the Son of God in a different, much higher way. We also see it in 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Only begotten comes from one Greek word, mono, which means one, and genes, which means born. It can be, in general, unique. Jesus is unique, but he is more than that. He is the only begotten of the Father. But begotten means to give 
birth to a child. It means the father's part in siring a child. Is Jesus a literal son of God born to him that way? He's the only begotten. He is unique. But is he literally born of God? Is that what it means? He is unique from among all the others who are called sons of God because he is included in this Trinitarian formula. Jesus teaches his followers to go and make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We would never put any angels into this Trinitarian formula. No pastor, no theologian can say, you know, baptize them in God's name and in my name. That would be blasphemy. So Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son on a whole different level because he's part of the Trinitarian God. He claims in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. It's like Father, like Son, because the Father and the Son are one. In a different sense, he is the Son of God because he is God. He is a part of the Godhead. He is not a Son in every sense, especially in the sense in which we think. He's not God's sense, God's Son in our sense. My son is my son because I and his mother, my wife, gave birth to them. Is Jesus God's son because God sired him, gave birth to him? No, but he is God's son in some sense. We'll come to that later. But is he really the son? Yes, he is, but in a different sense than any others that are referred to. The question comes up then, how long has he been the son? Was he not the son until he was born in Bethlehem and he became the son of Mary and the son of God? Was he not in existence before that? Was he not in existence before God created him at the beginning? How long has he been the son? That's our second question. And in Luke 135, as the angel makes the announcement to Mary that she's going to have a son, he said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Jesus will be the Son of Mary, but He is also the Son of God, fully human and fully man. So He is called the Son at His incarnation, at His conception. Physically, He's conceived, but incarnation means God taking on a body. And He is already the Son before He becomes the Son of Mary. He's also called the Son at his baptism, as we saw earlier in Luke 3.22, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. God the Father called Jesus his Son at his baptism. Likewise, at his resurrection, he is declared to be the Son of God. Acts 13.33 we read, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Was Jesus born, or did Jesus become the son in his resurrection? No, he already was. And he raised him from the dead. The resurrection declares his sonship is part of the Trinity. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he is declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. How do we know that Jesus is different from the angels, different from Adam, different from the nation Israel? Because God raised him from the dead, and Jesus is the only begotten Father and the raised Son. At his resurrection, the Father calls him, You are my beloved Son. We also see this as, it ascent, as his ascension takes place, as he returns to the Father in heaven. God in these last days, Hebrews 1, 2, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins on the cross, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the Son and called so at his birth, at his baptism, at his resurrection, and at his ascension as he now sits at the right hand of the Father. So what we're talking about is the eternal sonship of Jesus. And God quoted in Acts 13 from Psalm 2-7, remember the second Psalm. 
I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. I dare you to find how in the world God can say to himself, I am my own father, I am my own son. These are two persons in the same Godhead. This is the teaching of the Bible. There is one God expressed in three persons. And God says to me, this is Christ, the second person saying, you are my, the Father's son. Today I have begotten you. And here's what I want you to think about. There are some who say Jesus became the son when the human being Jesus was indwelt by the second person of the Trinity or when the Christ came upon Jesus, he became the son of God. No, the Bible teaches that Jesus has always been the son because for God, there is no today. God is outside of space and he's outside of time. He is omnipresent, he's omniscient, outside of the world that he made. And so for him, time is not relevant. He understands our time. He works within time as he works within his world. But there is no change in God. So when he says, today I've begotten you, he has always been God's son. God the Father before creation was God the Father. And God the Son before creation was God the Son. And so he is, we would say, eternally begotten. That's what the sonship means. He has always been the son. There's always been three parts of the Trinity, and we reject the heresy of modalism that is sweeping through, unfortunately, televangelists and, and the church today. Modalism as if God became Jesus and Jesus now becomes the Holy Spirit. No, that's not Trinitarianism, that's Unitarianism. It's an ancient heresy. And Christianity has always believed in the Father, Son, and the Spirit, as taught here and elsewhere. In Psalm chapter 2, it is clearly taught there is a God the Father and a God the Son before Jesus Christ came into Mary's womb or at Bethlehem. In Romans 1, 3, and 4, we'll go back to, we saw it in the resurrection. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, that's Joseph's line, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Notice the Trinity here. God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit. By the resurrection of the dead. Notice that he is eternally the Son. He was the Son even before he was born, even before he was incarnated. This is the eternal Sonship of Jesus. Now, there is this repetition of the Son being given. And I want you to notice the son is given in Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, oftentimes quoted at Christmas, it's in Handel's Messiah. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is all talking about Jesus. He's one with the Father. He's not the Father, he's the Son, but he is called Mighty God. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is not just Son of God, he is God the Son. But here I want you to focus on that phrase, a son is given. Jesus was among the Trinity, the one who was given for our sins. In John 3, 16, we've quoted it already. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The Son is given. We see it in John eleven twenty seven, when Mary says, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. He is given by the Father. The Son of God is given. And in Galatians 4, 4, Paul puts it this way. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. God the Father gives his Son. God the Father sends his Son to die on the cross for our sins. The Son is the one who comes on our behalf. But I want you to see that he was the Son before he came. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, but to the Son, he says, and this is an eternity before Jesus is born. To the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, God the Father, calls God the Son, God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now this is God the Father speaking, and he's speaking to the Son, and he calls him God, and he says he is God forever and ever. He has always been God. He will always be God. Jesus did not become God, as the Mormons teach. God did not become Jesus, as the modalists teach, like T.D. Jakes and Stephen Furtick. They reject the Trinity, and therefore they reject Orthodox Christianity. It is the eternal sonship 
of Jesus taught in the New Testament. And later on, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, we read this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that doesn't mean that Jesus never became the Son of God, I don't know what it could mean. It means that he's the same. You know what that means in Greek? It means he's the same. He's always been God the Son. He's always been the second person of the Trinity. He did not become so in some ancient decision between the Father and whatever he was called before he was called the Son. It doesn't mean that he became the Son when he was born in Bethlehem. It doesn't mean he became the Son when the Christ came upon a human being called Jesus. He has always been the same. Yes, he became a human being, but the second person of the Trinity in his essential nature always was the Son of the Father. And so, in the New Testament, the Bible clearly teaches the, the eternal begottenness, the eternal sonship of the Son. This is not an office that he took upon himself. It is an intrinsic part of his nature. He was born as a human not to become a son, but because he was the Son and always go, was going to be the one who was given. Okay? So, he is a son in some sense, and he's always been the son. But what does it really mean that he is the son? If he's not literally born of the father, doesn't derive his origin, his birth from the father, then why is he called a son? And let's look at the negative first. That's the easiest. What does it not mean? And the first thing I want to point out is it does not mean that he finds his origin in the father, as my sons and my daughter found their origin in me and their mother, my wife. Jesus did not find his origin in the Father because he had no origin. He is eternal God. Now, Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible, the firstborn over all creation. But that doesn't mean that he was born. He is the firstborn as an office, but it doesn't mean he was literally born. We know that because the Bible tells us clearly in John chapter 1, the very beginning of John, he's telling us the story not of a man, but of a God who became a man, the man Jesus Christ. So he starts self-consciously repeating Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. So the Word was separate from God because he was with God. I can't be with myself. And the Word was God. Jehovah Witnesses try to weasel out and put in the word A there. The word was a God if there's, as if there was more than one. That is not allowed by the Greek. That's a terrible Greek translation, and it's also a terrible heresy. Jesus was God. That's what John 1.1 1, 1 says very clearly. He was in the beginning with God. He had no beginning. So to say that Jesus had an origin is to blaspheme Jesus. He is God the Son and he's eternal, and he was there in the beginning with God. Who is the Word? Well, if we go to verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Even the Jehovah Witnesses recognize that's Jesus. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the only begotten of the Father, but he was never literally begotten. He is God's Son in an office kind of way, but not in an origin kind of way, because he is, as God, co-eternal with God. He had no origin because he is by definition eternal. It also does not mean derivation, how he was derived, where he came from. Jesus says to the Jews in John 8, 58, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's not just saying I was before Abraham, I'm really, really old. He's actually saying I have no origin, I have no derivation. The word I am is the Hebrew word Jehovah, I am what I am, I have always been. I am the self-existent one, the self-sufficient one. I need no derivation. I come from no father and mother. A child instinctively asks, where did I come from? Well, where did you come from? Or where did the world come from? If we don't answer God, we have to say nowhere. But Jesus didn't come from anywhere because he has no derivation. He is God. Again, John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. He wasn't derived, he was there in the beginning. He was in the beginning with God. He became a human being, but he was already the son. And so now we're not only saying he has no origin. He is also self-sufficient. I'm not self-sufficient. I, need, I needed my parents to exist. And we all need each other. In some way, we are all co-existing uh, and we are in inter, 
intertwined. We are interdependent upon one another, but Jesus is dependent on no one for his origin, his derivation, and we also don't mean that he is in any way inferior to the Father. John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. To say that Jesus is the Son of God does not mean that he is less than God. It means that he is equal with God, and even his enemies, the Jews, recognize that. To say that my Father was there before me is not to say that my Father is better than me, stronger than me, smarter than me. It means he's a human being, and I'm a human being, and I have all the rights and privileges as a human being, as an American that my father had. And so Jesus, in being the Son of God, is not saying, oh, I'm just the Son of God, I'm not all that. He's saying, I am the Son of God, and saying, I have all the rights and privileges of God, because he is saying here, he is co-equal with the Father. And that's what he's saying in John 5, 23. Jesus says, all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Don't honor the Father and honor me a little bit less. No, honor me exactly as you honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him because they are one. In no way does calling Jesus the Son of God put him down, downgrade him. He is saying that he is equal with God. And so in John 10, 30, when he says, I and my Father are one, He's saying we are one God, we are two persons, and our relationship is somehow like your father in some relationship. But later in that same chapter, verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, A good work, we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. When Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, the Jews understood him correctly. Jesus said, Oh, no, no, you misunderstood me. No, no, no. He meant to say that he was the Son of God, that he was co-equal with God. So when we say Son of God, we don't mean less than God. We mean equal with God. So here's what it does mean. So he is Son, but he's not literally the offspring. He's not born of the Father. He had no origin, didn't come from the Father. What does it mean? First of all, it means submission, voluntary submission. In John 8, 29, Jesus says, He who sent me, the Father, is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Here's a picture of a child doing what he's told to do in willing submission. The child, as a minor, is not as strong, is not as smart, doesn't have the rights and privileges, doesn't have the job and the earnings, but the son, the daughter, has equal rights under the law, but they do submit themselves because they are a child, and voluntarily they learn to obey, it's for their own good. The son has voluntarily submitted to the father, and here's that beautiful picture of an obedient child doing those things that please the father. It means that in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, Paul says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Does that mean that Christ is less than God? No. No more than it means that a woman is less than a man. A woman is not less than a man. Men don't have more rights than women. In the home, we have, sometimes we have, sometimes we have the headship of the man over the wife. Nowhere in the Bible does it say men are over women. It does say that a wife is to voluntarily submit to her husband as a child is to voluntarily submit to parents. But here, Christ voluntarily submits to God. And so we want to see here that it is, a, it is not an inferiority, it is a willing submission, the choice of the Son. But it also means dependence. John 6, 57, Jesus says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. He didn't have his origin in the Father, but he says, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. He is saying that in some sense, like a son is dependent on a father, to feed him and to turn the lights on and to pay the light bill and to make sure that he's taken care of, that there is some sort of dependence between, codependence between the father and the son, but the son is dependent on the father. It also means something beautiful. It means imitation. You ever seen a child walking literally in his father's footsteps, walking behind mommy maybe in the snow, stepping in the footprints? A father is imitated by a son, a mother imitated by his daughter, and sometimes mothers and 
Uh, sons and daughters imitate both. We see in John 5, 19, no one has seen God at any time, or John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And here's the picture. Remember our title is like Father, like Son. Jesus imitates the Father. And in 519, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. There is the beautiful picture of a child following in a mother or father's footsteps Jesus Christ imitates his Father. We are supposed to imitate him as well. We can't perfectly as Jesus does, but Jesus is the mirror image. He is the image of his Father God, and he imitates him like a son imitates a father. It also means something even more beautiful than that, and that is, um, it means affection as well. But let's one more imitation. When John chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and Thomas says, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, oh, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? In one sense, if you see Jesus, the son, you see the father because they are one. But in another sense, you see what the Father is like because the Son imitates the Father. But here's where it gets even more precious, more beautiful. Father, Son means affection. And over and over again, Jesus says the Father loves the Son. For instance, in John 3, 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. This is a beautiful, in a Trinitarian love story. We see it in John 5, 20, where the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. Any good father loves his son, loves his children, loves his daughter. The father loves the son. We see it again in John chapter 15. As the father loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. But it's not a one-way street. You know, a father loves a, a little son much more than a son could ever love a father. If, if When you're a baby, you may be dependent on mom and dad, but you really don't love them. If mom or dad died, you wouldn't even know at certain ages if they're a little bit older, they just, when they're young, they can't love like a parent loves a child. But Jesus, the Son, loves the Father in John 14, 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. The Son here loves the Father in a co-equal way. There is mutual affection between the two, such that Jesus calls him in Mark 14, 36, Abba, or the Greek word, Daddy, Father. It is a it's an endearing term, daddy. And he is the son in the sense that there is affection between the father and the son. One last one. It also means honor. We are to honor them alike, but also they honor each other. In that high priestly prayer that we already quoted from, John 17, 1, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hours come. You glorify me. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. They both honor one another, but we're also to honor them. And so in John 17, he prays later that the glory which you gave me, I've given them. Father, I desire, verse 24, that they whom you gave me may be with me, that they may behold my glory which you've given me. You've given me glory, but now I want them to give me the glory that they give you. Because Jesus says in that well-loved verse, John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. You trust in the Father. Good. But you need to tr trust in me in the same way. In the same way that you believe in God, believe in me. No pastor can say that. No pastor can say, believe God, believe me to the same degree. No way. John 5, 23. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so those who go door to door calling themselves Jehovah Witnesses and dishonoring Christ by saying he is not God, he is not co-equal with the Father, don't really honor the Father. And they're not really Jehovah's Witnesses if they reject Jesus' deity. Jesus says, honor me just as you honor the Father. He is not an inferior creature. He's not a creation of God. He is the only begotten Son. And we have to ask, okay, so what? What does that mean to us now? 
You remember the story in Genesis chapter 22 where God asked the impossible of Abraham, his miraculous son in his old age, he loves so much Isaac. God says, I want you to take him to the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham, who had much more obedience than I ever could have had, without question just went and assumed that God would raise him from the dead because God had made a promise to him that through this child, his seed would come. He took his child up there, was ready to slay him, and God said, stop, don't do it. Maybe on the very same mountain where Jesus Christ gave himself, God the Father did not spare his son. The son left the father in Hebrews chapter 10, and then in John 3, 16, the son gave his life, and the father gave his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Reminds me of an old story of a father who took his son to work. He worked on the the train uh, switching station on the bridge. It was his job to raise the bridge when uh, the ships were coming and then lower the bridge when a train was coming. And he wanted to show his son his important job. So he took him and he showed him the great big gears and the lever that he had to pull. And he, they watched the, the boat go by as he raised the bridge. And then they watched the train go by as he lowered the bridge. He took his eyes off his son for a moment as he was up in the control booth, and then he noticed that the train was coming, so he had to lower the gears. But he looked down and he saw to his horror, his son had climbed down the ladder, down to the bridge and into the gearbox that would drop this trestle bridge. He realized he only had a few seconds to make a choice. Would he leave the bridge up and allow everyone on that train to die a fiery death? Or would he lower the bridge? He didn't have time to do both. Would he lower the bridge and give his only son? And he did the only thing he could do. He really didn't have time to even get down there to save his son. He pulled the bar, he pulled the bar and he lowered the gears. He turned his head away. He did not want to hear the cries of pain from his son. But then after he had lowered the bridge, the train whistled by and he looked into the windows of the passers by, in the windows, eating their meal, reading the paper, and all I could think of was, don't you know what I have done to save you? You have any idea the sacrifice I made? You don't even know as you go on your merry way what I have done to save you. That is a beautiful illustration of the love that the Father has for us. For God so loved the world that he willingly gave his only begotten Son. I might be willing to die for you on a good day if I love you a lot, but I would never give my son. I would never give one of my dear children for all of the world, but God did for you. And that's what the sonship of Jesus means. God the Father loves the son, but God the Father loves you, and he gave his son for you. Don't just go by and ignore the sacrifice that was made. It was a beautiful gift of love to you, for you, for your sins, and accept it today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the sonship of Jesus Christ, the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we believe you are God, that you are the only begotten of the Father, and that you were given for us, for our salvation. Lord, help us to not just take it for granted. Help us to know who you are and to honor you as we honor the Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join us again next week as we study the virgin birth of Jesus.